Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a very soggy outside, thinking it has not stopped raining all day here. And I must confess, I have put the heating on. So summer is officially drawing to a close. I can see my colleague Steph laughing at me when she sees that. Um, my name is Liz Mosley. I'm the editor of this evening's Thinking. And um, it's a pleasure to um, welcome you and some excellent experts um, to the conversation about um, inherent sexism in medical uh, science and treatment and whether um, the virus, which would seem to affect men um, significantly worse or, and certainly differently than it affects women in terms of mortality rates, um, might be a, a catalyst to a new way of thinking about um, how um, sex disaggregated data in particular in terms of medical research and clinical trials could um, lead to better health outcomes for women in particular. Um, I was became interested in, in fact, I only really became aware of this notion of medical sexism when um, Caroline Criado Perez's book Invisible Women came out um, a couple of years ago. And that really seemed to sort of elevate an awareness of it into the mainstream, although if I were to take myself as a sample size of one um, and think about the instances of significant women in my life who have experienced um, uh, misdiagnosis um, and been dismissed, their pain and their, and their um, symptoms have been dismissed by members of the medical establishment, you might think that I would have cottoned on earlier in that um, my mum, um, uh, went to the doctor and said, I feel that my body is swollen. The doctor said, that's because you're fat and sent her home. And two weeks later, um, uh, ovarian cyst the size of a rugby ball ruptured inside of her and she was rushed to hospital. Two years later, she went back with a persistent cough, was told she had asthma and given an inhaler. Three months later, she had died of lung cancer. My partner has spent 27 years um, getting a diagnosis of endometriosis. Two years ago, she went to a female GP in London who told her that her excruciating pain was because it was psychosomatic and down to the fact that she was upset that she hadn't had a baby yet. So if I'm a sample size of one, and those are my experiences, um, it would be perhaps not unreasonable to suggest that this is a rather widespread and very serious thing. So my opening question to the floor, and as you know with Thinkins, we really do want to hear your stories too, because what we're doing here is trying to look for stories that we can tell that somehow moves the conversation on from what we already know. I'm going to ask you to put your hand up, um, not if you have experienced something that you feel was a medical treatment that involved some kind of sexism or sex discrimination, um, yourself as a woman or a woman close to you. Um, but if you haven't, if you have not encountered treatment by medical establishment that you would consider to be in some way um, perhaps affected by the fact that you were not being taken seriously, that yourself or, or, or somebody close to you was a woman, could you put your hand up if you, that just isn't something that you're aware of and has never happened to you? You can find your little blue hand um, if you click the participants button, it should give you a raise hand option. So if you've never encountered it, please put your hand up now. And it's slightly a flawed methodology in my research, but nobody's hand has gone up, which I'm taking that certainly the majority of people, at least if they can find their digital hand, have believed that this has happened to them. So I'm interested in that. Um, and I think we should explore it. I'm not going to ask people to share um, personal stories that they may not be um, you know, ready to, to share, but um, perhaps we might go first, if, you, if you'd like to tell your stories, then I'm, re I'm really keen to hear some examples of them. Um, I might go first, if I can, to Sarah Graham, who is one of our invited speakers this evening, and she has um, done a, a ton of very important sourcing actually of per personal anecdotes is a big part of what you do. You're the founder of the Hysterical Women uh, blog. Um, and I wonder, Sarah, 
as I said to you just before we started the conversation, we're taking medical sexism as a given in this conversation for the purposes of this evening. Um, I wonder if you might just sort of crack open um, the discussion by saying why? How can it be that half the world is taken less seriously when it comes to their pain, let's say, than the other half? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Liz. Um, I guess kind of as, as we were talking about, about before we started, it is a huge kind of complex question and I don't think um, that there's a simple answer to it. So I started looking at this a few years ago. So I'm a freelance journalist. I've been writing about women's health for several years and um, a, a bit like you really talking about your personal experiences with your mum and your partner. I had noticed that there were several, you know, I was writing for lots of different places about lots of different issues across kind of mental and physical health um, and noticing kind of sim similar patterns to, to the ones that you talked about of, of women not being taken seriously, women um, feeling that they were being dismissed or that it was just being put down. Oh, it's just hormones. It's, you know, it's just, it's normal because you're a woman um, and all women kind of suffer. And this is just kind of an inevitable part of being a woman. Um, and so I started Hysterical Women, the blog as, um, I suppose, a way of bringing all of those ideas and stories together. Um, and we've had, I'm not actually sure off the top of my head, we've had dozens and dozens of, of women submit stories, um, you know, very similar to the ones that you talked about. And it, it does seem to be the case that, you know, once you start talking about it, I think a lot of women... Um, sort of assume that it's just them it's an isolated incident they were just unlucky um and like you saying that you've never really kind of connected the dots i think that's the case for a lot of women and actually what's been really powerful about the blog is that you know even women in my own life in my own life who have you know perhaps never considered it have kind of read all of these stories and gone oh yeah my god like this happened to me and this happened to me um and in terms of, of why it's an issue, I think, um, so the writer Maya Dusenbury puts this in a really nice, kind of simple, straightforward way in her book, Doing Harm, which she talks about um, these sort of two problems. One is a knowledge gap and the other is a trust gap. Mm -hmm. So the knowledge gap um, looks at, you know, the fact that women historically have been excluded from medical research. We don't know as much about conditions that primarily affect women. Um, women are not or have not um, historically been included in clinical trials. Um, so we just don't know as much about women's health, women's bodies, um, because I suppose we have this system where, you know, and, and race and other factors come into this as well, but you very much have a system set up where the kind of white male body is the default. And so everything that we know really about health is based on the white male body and you, you see that even down to the fact that you know painkillers um, react differently in male bodies to, to female bodies so that's that's the knowledge gap that, um, that Maya talks about and the second is the trust gap which is I suppose a little bit more what the kind of personal stories on hysterical women are interested in looking at and that um, again I think is really complex I think there's lots of uh, kind of interconnected stuff around unconscious bias, you know, medical education. Um, and the reason that the, the blog is called what it's called really is because I felt that there were interesting issues to explore around the history of hysteria and the fact that, you know, in the past, um, you know, and I think it was only something like 1980 that hysteria was taken out of, of the DSM, um, is no longer considered a, a official diagnosis but there has been this tendency in the past where if you couldn't explain a woman's symptoms you didn't understand what was wrong with her and the existing tests that you had were not finding anything wrong with her that um hysteria was this kind of i suppose catch-all diagnosis that you could just kind of say oh it's it that's what it is mm -hmm. um so i think you know we do see a bit of a hangover from that, um, you know, which, which again you can see in in, in recent ish, recent um, things like the Cumberledge report, which talks about women uh, and their 
concerns and their health issues being dismissed as um, as women's issues that that was the, the word that was used in the in the report um, so I think that is another really big thing I think you know we all have our own biases um, conscious and unconscious that, that we take into our jobs and doctors are not exempt from that um, and you know, I'm always very clear when I talk about the blog and, and when I write about it that I'm not against doctors. You know, a lot of the stories are very critical of sort of individual doctors and the things that they've said and the decisions that they've made. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's really important to be clear that these are sort of systemic issues. Um, and actually, you know, medical science is not infallible. I think a, a big part of the issue is you know, medicine perhaps needs to have a bit more willingness to say, we don't know yet, we don't understand this yet. Um, and I think, again, that's that's where COVID is really interesting and really useful because it is so new and, and we are learning as we go along. Yeah, I mean, there is so much that we don't know. And I think that of those two gaps, the knowledge gap and the trust gap, it's the knowledge gap that I'm particularly interested in for the purposes of today's conversation, because the trust gap is a is it that they're both related clearly but the trust gap is something that is, you can't close with legislation mm. and with you know concerted efforts and change and specific policies um because it's a sort of product of millennia of cultural stuff and um, the knowledge gap is something that in theory we should be able to chip away at which which might be a good um opportunity uh, to to bring in lois lois rogers who's joined us um last minute thank you so much Lois for um, giving a, a chunk of your evening and um, because Kath Samson who, who is the founder of the Sing the Mesh campaign was unable to join us at, at short notice and Lois has nobly stood in and um, Lois is a, a, an influential and a, a, and a much published journalist in the space of, of women's health um, and I was going to ask you um, Sarah just mentioned the Cumberland report because this was the sort of news story outside of COVID that landed sort of this summer, um, which was the result of an inquiry into three specific treatments um, that had affected um, women particularly. And, and, and a sort of, it's a really hard piece of evidence about how treatments make it to market without sufficient testing and checks and balances and affect women in a, in a very specific way. Would you, are you able to sort of just talk through a little bit for those people who aren't familiar with what happened there. Yeah, so the that report looked at three specific areas. The first was um, the uh, vaginal mesh, which is uh, used for um, in, uh, post childbirth incontinence, which affects some extraordinary number of women, something like 40% of all women have some level of incontinence following childbirth. Uh, there's also a significant inse uh, incidence of pelvic damage as a result of childbirth, uh, prolapse, uterus, and that sort of uh, another sort of yeah. severe tearing, scarring, etc. So this um, polypropylene material was introduced to be inserted blind into the pelvis. I mean, it's just, it doesn't bear thinking about. So um, gynaecologists were being invited to sort of thread it blind into women's uh, pelvic area um, using keyhole surgery, but nevertheless, it could do huge damage. You know, you could go straight through the ureter, you could go straight into any number of other bits of um, pelvic organ blood vessels. Um, but they um, reckon they could do it, and, um, and they did. And uh, there are thousands of women who've got it, and it appears to have worked, but there is a significant minority, depending on which study you look at, who have had horrific problems with it disintegrating into little plastic shards, which then migrate around the whole area and embed into soft tissue and cause nerve damage, chronic inflammation and chronic pain. So that was, um, and we don't really know how many women have had this stuff uh, put in them, but um, it's, it's probably around 100,000 over the last 15 years or so. Unlike drugs, uh, medical devices can be introduced with 
virtually no testing. They have to go through the same process as is used for the approval of toasters or children's toys. You know, it's just a sort of um, very basic safety test. So that was the first That's thing. Extraordinary. I'm sorry, Lois. That is extraordinary that, that a, a medical device mm. has the same degree of pre-market testing, safety testing as a toy, a toaster, a, a just a sort of standard consumer product. That seems absolutely extraordinary to me. It, it is absolutely outrageous. And I mean, the, this, the vaginal mesh is the worst example, I think, but there are many others of, um, you know, we've had all the problems with substandard hip, artificial hip joints, um, pacemakers, any number of prosthetics, breast implants, um, anything you put in your body um, has the potential to set up um, an autoimmune reaction of some description at the very least but the pelvic mesh was actually disintegrating I think it probably disintegrates in everyone um, eventually it's the level it's it's basically whether you die before it's done you any major damage. Is, and is your sense of the reason why that requirement for sort of consumer level testing on something that is going to be surgically put inside of somebody's body um, is that because there's a sort of appetite for innovation that sort of exceeds any caution and safety? It, 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 I just can't imagine who signed the piece of paper to say, yep, that's fine. Just start putting it inside of people. That's it's staggering. It, yes, it is. But it's um, it, it is a worldwide problem. It's not peculiar to us. I mean, we our, our um, legislation is an, is a European model and there are agencies all over Europe that um, uh, approve these products and so if you want you can I mean it's well known in the industry which ones are sort of softer touches and so you might go to Romania or somewhere to get approval for something that's then going to be available to be marketed uh, throughout the EU and the yeah. British Medical Journal did a stunt uh, where they got the mesh that's used for you know the bags that you buy oranges in yeah, that's approved as a medical device for insertion in the human body. And despite that being, you know, you would have thought an appalling scandal. That was about six or seven years ago. Nothing has changed. So there's that one that was part of the Cumberledge review. And then there were two others. Um, the next one was a... Um, Epilepsy. Uh, treatment was it an epilepsy treatment of some yeah, sodium valproate which yeah. uh, caused a birth defect in pregnant women um, which again was appalling and they were sort of uh, women were with severe epilepsy were presented with sort of no choice they were told that um, they really had to go on taking this drug but that it, uh, it probably wouldn't have any effects on um, on fetal development, which it most certainly did. And um, the third one, just briefly, sorry, Lois, I'm very conscious of time. The third one was um, a pregnancy test. Was it a test for, for yeah. if you were pregnant or not? It was a test, a pregnancy test, which um, induced um, a period. And uh, the idea was that if you could induce a period, you couldn't possibly be pregnant. And it didn't cross their minds. This yeah. was during the German drug company. It didn't cross their minds that this might actually cause fetal abnormality in someone who was already pregnant. If you try to in induce menstrual ble bleeding, you will be very likely to damage the fetus. So that was the third one. And there have been decades of protest about this, which culminated in the Cumberland Review. Thank you. And the, 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 the upshot of the review, the sort of conclusion was, yes, all three of these treatments, the MESH, the pregnancy test and the epilepsy treatment, were all significantly flawed. And the sort of conclusion, the sentence was, you know, the system has, has massively failed yes, with, and needs to change. But the, uh, the review was released on the same day by accident on purpose as some much bigger news announcement. I can't remember what it was, but Julia Cumberledge, who led it, was... Um, extraordinarily dismayed that um, you know this it was buried project was buried yeah so I don't think it will lead to any change thank you Lois um, I'm going to go now if I can um, now it's 10 to 7 to my colleague Ella Hill if she's there Ella are you there 
Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, you've done some work. Sometimes it's helpful in, in a conversation. Just before I come to our third expert speaker, um, Dr. Ripalone, um, to get some data to look at to kind of ground our thinking in what actually we do know of um, various things like this. And you've done a bit of background work on that. So if Alfie could share the screen, then and Ella, take it away. Help us understand what's going on here. So on this slide, we've got um, some numbers from a study that was released earlier this year, and this analysed thousands of clinical trials published over the last 25 or so years. And this research found that for a number of conditions, the makeup of female and male trial participants didn't reflect the actual gender composition of patients with that illness. And this is reflective of you know, the broader trend that women are often underrepresented in clinical research. And um, Sarah spoke a bit about that knowledge gap for doctors um, and how women have different symptoms and different physiological reactions to drugs. And underrepresentations of women in, in clinical trials is a big contributor to that knowledge gap. And biological sex, as Sarah mentioned, isn't the only area where we find underrepresentation. Clinical trials also fail to represent ethnic and racial diversity and older people as well. And moving on to the next one, if we can. Um, Lois spoke about the independent review of those three medicines and medical devices, which was led by Baroness Cumberledge. We've got a summary um, of those three devices and drugs, which the review covered here. Um, and as Lois said, the review found that women's huge physical pain and um, the effects on their children had been dismissed and ignored by doctors in the medical system for decades. And slide three, if we can. So one of the things that we want to talk a bit about this evening is the way that COVID has kind of shown us how important sex disaggregated data is. Um, it's allowed us to see, as you'll see here, that men are worse affected than women by COVID, both in terms of the severity of the infection, more men are hospitalised, for example, and mortality, that more men are dying from the disease. And this information is helping doctors treating patients right now, and it will help researchers in the future understand more things about how men and women and their immune responses differ um, in terms of respiratory infections and coronavirus infections. Um, but if we move on to the next slide, there are areas where we still aren't collecting a lot of data. Um, there isn't much data on how pregnancy affects patients with COVID, for example, um, or on how COVID will affect the outcome of a woman's pregnancy. So whether she'll have a preterm birth or um, you know, the outcomes for her baby. Um, there have been a couple of studies, but this isn't something that many countries are systematically collecting data about. Um, and finally, if you want to read a bit more about bias in medicine and how sexism has impacted women, there are a few books, a couple of which have already been mentioned. So uh, Liz mentioned Caroline Criado Perez, and um, I think Sarah mentioned Maya Dusenberry. So both of those books are on this list um, and I'll put some of those recommendations in the chat for you all as well. Uh, thank you very much, Ella. It is really helpful to sort of um, segue into a sort of COVID part of the conversation because I'm going to come now to our third invited guest who's Dr Catherine Ripalone who is an acad academic clinical fellow at the Nuffield just down the road from where I am in Oxford and uh, with the George Institute and you're a clinician to you OBS and Gynae um, so um, thank you very much um, indeed for your time in particular and the reason why we really wanted to invite um, you this evening um, Dr Ripplone is because you have a particular area of interest and work in um, sex disaggregated data when it comes to clinical research and um, I, I, I think this is actually from a, a piece that you and some colleagues of yours wrote um, 
that talked about how sort of only around half of the countries who are of course regularly reporting on confirmed cases and deaths of COVID-19 are routinely disaggregating that data by sex. And then I don't have a more accurate um, statistic than most, but most countries um, are not reporting sex and pregnancy differentiated data on their progress to find testing, treatments and vaccine trials. So, so evidently, this is a, it's, a, it's a major, major problem. Would you just sort of talk to us a little bit about when it's so self-evidently required that men's bodies and women's bodies respond differently to both treatments and to diseases, what, what are the reasons why you wouldn't routinely include that in your research? So I think it's good to look at this through um, different levels. So the first level, if you look at the um, biological, the very kind of bench science level, um, you can start looking at things of why aren't experiments done on, on female rats? Well, the answer is because male rats are cheaper and you don't have to deal with hormones in the female rats. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, your very basic level of why things aren't being done on a very okay. mechanistic level. Then you start looking at more of a, a, a broader population level and you're looking at things like RCTs and the data that's available. Um, and again, it just, it's considered too difficult and too complicated, I think, to collect, to make sure that you're representative. Um, and there's a lot of things, so the ethics boards, you know, can you have pregnant women in a trial? Well, there's discussions on that, you know, lots of, lots and lots of discussions about that that have been documented and some say, no, you can't do this, but then you don't have any data on it and which is more ethical, not having more data or protecting women from being in the trial. Um, and so that systematically leads to the underrepresentation of pregnant women in trials, especially um, and so if you look, so the, the ones that you showed, um, that your colleague showed were very good because on average, the, the percentages I've seen in RCTs um, for women is 25%. Right. Um, so actually much, much lower. And again, part of it is that when you extract that data, then you want to be able to come up with associations. Mm -hmm. And then you say, okay, well, what happens if they're postmenopausal? What happens if they're premenopausal? Yeah. Did we collect data on that? And if you don't have that depth of knowledge, so it's not just gen, it's not just sex disaggregating the data. It's actually thinking about what other data points do you need when you include women yeah. to accurately yes, analyze the data. Right. And um, so I think there's a barrier relating to cost. There's a barrier relating to complexity because once yeah. you start with disaggregating something, then the sort of intersectional, the intersectional boxes, they get so big, you know, so have we got enough of everybody in all of these different intersections? Exactly. And then there's an ethical question as well, yeah. sometimes with women as well. Um, so I think those are the main barriers to sex disaggregation currently. Um, is it okay I just quickly say to Sarah one <laughs> thing? Um, I completely agree that the male body is the, the basis and I'm um, actually um, in medical school, it's the basis. So a really simple example, by the way, is um, when we were taught anatomy, we were only taught surface anatomy on women, on men rather, not on women. And obviously women tend to kind of gain weight in different areas. We have boobs. You have to, you know, figure out where the heart rate is and where, you know, once you're pregnant, things move around. And we were never taught the surface anatomy on women. So I completely agree with you because it starts from an educational standpoint. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm absolutely, I'm, I've never been so flabbergasted so many times over in a thinking. <laughs> Is that true of all medical students? Medical students don't learn female surface anatomy. So basically the way that you learn it is you have a picture and, and the way that you can learn it in a fun way that they try to make it interactive is you draw on a partner and um, like in the classroom. And of okay. course it's a male partner that takes off their top. So they don't ask necessarily girls to come in with a sports bra on. They don't, you know, and it is a, it is a problem because our bodies are different and you do need to know how to examine a female body effectively and how, you know, so you know, it's just, it's something that we raised with our medical school and they've approached it, but yeah, it's a very common issue. Wow. Extraordinary. Um, and just before the thinking started, you said something that I thought was fascinating, which is in spite of all those barriers and how difficult it is to make your 
um, clinical trial data um, or your research data suitably um, weighted to represent all of the different variations by age, by all of that, um, that Canada nonetheless has just legislated to make it be required. So how is that going to work? How are they going to overcome those barriers? So I think Canada is a great example. Um, so basically what they're saying is that they're not going to approve research. So either from a funding perspective, so where the money is coming from as well as the ethics, if it isn't going to produce representative data that's gender disaggregated, which I think is really important. And so it has to come from a, you know, it's, it's about policy and where the money's going. And if you cut off the money to studies that aren't going to produce representative data, then you fix the problem. Um, there is interest in Australia for doing this actually with the George. Right. Um, and the MRC in this country is kind of hummed and hawed about it. I don't think we've really gotten to very serious conversations about that, but that is something that we are looking at in terms of as a global health institute focusing on this at the George, trying to facilitate that policy switch right. at the national level. Okay, fascinating. And the Global 5050 um, organization, that's based in the UK, is it? Um, I'm not sure exactly where it's based, I have to say, um, but I do know that um, it again focuses on gender disaggregated data and specifically on COVID. It's been tracking yeah. a lot of, you know, where, you know, what countries, as I said, as we mentioned in that publication, what countries are reporting gender disaggregated data, what, what countries are not. And that is just really helpful because if you want to look at it at a population level, it is yeah. a global pandemic and you want to look at different populations. And there's also, we mentioned race. There's also a racial thing. Um, and, you know, we're seeing in the UK that more BAME doctors, for example, yeah. have been affected. Yeah. And so I think if you really want to create a global data set that is not only able to kind of cross kind of sexes and look at sexes differently, but also look at the ethnicities and the races separately and also see the overlapping of that. Because if you look in this country, the worst outcomes are for Afro-Caribbean women, if you look at yeah. postnatal outcomes. Um, you know, so it's being a woman, but also being Afro-Caribbean, and you have to look at that intersectionality. Um, so that's why it's really important that it's not just a couple of countries doing this, but when you start really trying to look globally and get truly representative data, that yeah. a lot of countries are doing it. Yeah, I mean, I suppose you might say the one good thing of COVID-19 is that we're not sure of people who've suffered from it or have got it. You know, we ought to be able to mobilize a significant, statistically significant sample of people. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Ripple, and I might come back to you um, in a moment. I'm going to take a couple of comments, if I can, from people in the room. Sally Young's got her hand up and has made a, a, a really interesting point in the chat. Hi, Sally. Nice to see you. Hi. Thanks, Liz. Um, so I worked for many years, as at least one of the participants has done, who's, who's watching today, um, supporting people, supporting patients with, with their cases, particularly about complaints and wanting better treatment. Mm -hmm. And we saw this all the time, whether it, particularly through maternity, because that's the obvious area that you think about, obs and gynae, of course, when you're looking at maternal, um, you're looking at women. I mean, if we look at the um, percentage of women who are going through medical school, I think it's about 55% are women. Mm -hmm. um, the percentage from private schools, of course, is 25% as opposed to 7%. I don't know what the BAME numbers are, but I believe they're fairly high. So if we look, the majority of doctors are white men who are privileged. There's obviously more women coming through, um, but, but there's un undoubtedly that's it. And then clearly we've been hearing that the default patient is a white man. So you put all that together and then you look historically where women were, even if they were allowed to go to medical school, allowed, they weren't allowed to graduate. So you've got all the status there and everything is just, is just ripe for all of this. Mm. Now I have stories, as I, I think many others would have um, who, who are listening today, um, but there's clear inequality issue. And I, I saw quite a lot of this supporting um, particularly women who had mental health problems um, or were defined as having mental health problems in their lives. And actually, it was to do with their personal circumstances, but they were yeah. medicalized because of the abuse that they had, that they had um, unfortunately had in their lives. So this this goes right the way through. And even for someone like me, who you know has worked in the services, I've got I've got clinical qualifications, and I'm quite assertive. I've been patronised and misdiagnosed. So goodness knows what's happening to other women. 
Mm, thank you, Sally. Um, yeah, I mean, I think probably it would be worth us um, building on what Sally has said and in response to some of the things in the chat. Um, perhaps I'm, I might I might come back to Sarah, actually, because I've got I, I wrote down a quote. Um, I copied a quote from one of Sarah's inserts in on hysterical women. Um, I know it's probably awful when people read back to you the words that you've written, Sarah, so here it comes. Um, but you're about to do a, a, a mini series on hysterical women, um, particularly on uh, black women's health um, and, uh, and a sentence that you wrote um, which doesn't pull any punches as as is your won't uh, COVID-19 has disproportionately killed BAME people in the UK not for any innate biological reason but because of prejudice racial bias and socioeconomic disadvantage full stop um, now that's that that's a sort of very deliberate statement um, tell us a out. I mean, you obviously believe that to be the case. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I actually um, attended a very interesting um, discussion, not dissimilar to this one, but by an organisation called uh, Race and Health, which has been set up, uh, I think, in partly in response to COVID-19, um, but also sort of off the back of all of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement that, that's been going on as well this summer. Um, and that was one of the really interesting things that really came out of that discussion was actually the there don't seem to be kind of biological reasons why BAME people would be more likely to die and that actually you know so many of the reasons and, th and this is true as well with with men and women but so many of the sort of factors involved in in um how people are affected and how they are treated are to do with kind of socioeconomic um, factors. So, so one of the other things that was discussed in that was, you know, the impact of poverty and, you know, are you um, less likely to be taken seriously or to have access to good quality care if you live in poverty, if you're an ethnic minority. But I think there are also, um, you know, issues to do with how people engage in healthcare and one of the issues that I see a lot and I think is, is particularly true um, perhaps for people who've experienced racism as well as sexism uh, in, in the medical uh, profession is that actually it turns a lot of patients off and if you've been dismissed or, or sort of sent away um, I think there's a real issue with um, women and ethnic minorities choosing not to engage with healthcare in the future because there is that that sort of fear and that disillusionment so I think that's another again I, you know I think it's it's a hugely complex picture I don't think um that there is again an easy answer to the question yeah, but I think I think there are so many um different factors that you know are not to do with certainly when it comes to race are not actually to do with biological differences they're to do with differences in the way that people are treated and perceived um which obviously is, is different from from what we're talking about with with sex differences yeah, absolutely. yeah thank you sarah i agree and there, and there is certainly no easy answer i remember if i wind back to some of the thinkings we did sort of early in lockdown when um the sort of uh, how much we didn't know about the virus um it sort of seemed to accelerate daily almost we don't know this we don't know this we don't it, it was felt, felt very feverish and there was a lot of speculation about what would happen after lockdown came to an end and how would different sort of cohorts of people be advised to um manage and limit their own exposure you know there was a lot of talk about people over a certain age behaving differently from people under a certain age but then there was no sort of appreciation of the intersectional elements within that within those cohorts and it, it feels to me that they all they're all talking to the same problem which is everybody is unique and, and sure you might have you know our 12 buckets of types of people enough is it 64 is it 164 it's, it's sort of impossible to account for every possible um uh characteristic of a of a person um and, and how they would manage their own their own risk but nonetheless it talks to really uncomfortable horrible persistent and very mm. real um as you say socioeconomic cultural disadvantages that affect certain types of people that just get walloped from every side and um, i might come back actually because i'm I, i'm finding the um conversation between Catherine and lois in the chat irresistible um about 
um, whether or not there are lots more male doctors in senior roles. Um, Dr. Ripplone, you, you have insight into this, and it would seem like um, as you accelerate through the ranks, so, so I think somebody quoted a statistic, more than half of medical students are women, but then as you get closer to the top of the tree, the girls disappear, which of course is not unique to me medicine, but you've got some insight into, into this. Um, so yeah, so I would say, um, so this is another area of interest I've pu published with one of my other colleagues on a bit on this, um, is yeah, where are the women going? And especially in the NHS, which is supposed to be one of the fairest employers in the country, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a man or woman, if you're working the same job, you'll get paid the same thing. Um, the issue evolves, firstly, I would say, around women having to take time off for, for bearing children, and that's completely fine. The issue is, is that there is still a financial disincentive within the NHS and within this country that if men want to share in that, or if women don't want to take the full time, then even if the man wants to take the time, they're not financially compensated to the same extent yeah. as the woman is. Um, and so that's actually a big issue, especially for junior doctors. So um, the NHS doesn't have by default a shared parental leave uh, offer for everybody. No, so um, if a man wanted to take time off, they wouldn't necessarily get the statutory maternity pay. Okay, interesting. Um, secondly, um, or for example, a, a woman can have you know her ha her full pay for two months and then her half pay for six months up yeah. to you know so the four months. Again, that's not the same for a man. So you just have to you have to be very careful about how you allocate the time in terms of the financial repercussions. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, there's been a lot of research, which is very interesting about how trainees are perceived and what feedback they get. And so again, are you confident? Are you overconfident? Are you underconfident? Yeah. And what that tells you about competency and that all builds into your portfolio and that goes into your consultancy applications. And so there has been very interesting kind of research done on female trainees consistently being deemed less competent, underconfident, and therefore not as competitive yeah. when it comes to their senior positions. Yeah. And I would say that's a bit of a problem culturally with what we view as competence or yeah. signs of competence. Yes. Um, and I think that's incredibly important. Yes. Um, Again, just quickly going back to Sarah's point, I completely ag agree with you, by the way. I've done work with Syrian refugees and it was a huge issue about communicating about um, contraception and reproductive health because there's just a completely different language that was being used by the people providing healthcare and, that, and the refugees that were seeking it. And it was really, really difficult. Yeah, um, fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd love to, if she's okay to come on, hear briefly from Julie Ferguson. Um, if you're there, Julie, you've posted movingly in the chat about your situation. And I like this um, phrase I've not heard in this context before of long haulers. Um, and actually, funny enough, a colleague of mine um, at Sorters is looking at an investigation about, you know, long COVID. We don't, this, this disease would seem to have a very long tail. Just tell us a little bit about what you've been, been saying in the chat. Okay. Can everybody hear me first? Yeah, we can hear you beautifully. It's nice to see you. Second one, so I'm never sure if everything's switched on. <laughs> um, and I also told my son who got me into these things in the first place that I would just be listening, so he might walk in. <laughs> but yeah, um, sorry, long haulers was uh, was referring to people who've had COVID-19 and are, are suffering yes. um, the after effects. So a lot of what I've read about it sounds very similar to the kinds of issues that people with ME or um, chronic fatigue syndrome, however people call it. Uh, uh, you know, the main thing people concentrate on is the fatigue, but actually what I find most problematic when I'm, I'm fortunate, I'm able to work part time. It's a struggle, but uh, I'm able to do that, but it's the cognitive stuff. So I, I can take part in this tonight, but I might be absolutely wiped out. And even a conversation with you, I can suddenly start to lose energy or words. Yeah. And the most interesting piece I saw on television recently was actually a doctor who was suffering after effects of COVID-19. And in some ways, I think it's, it's once 
people who are either medical themselves or MPs or um, have access to research funding experience these things themselves. Um, like so many other things, it's when people with power uh, can get involved that things change. And that's not to dismiss activism from other people as well, but we, it's very difficult to get your voice heard until you can get close to someone who can kind of amplify yeah, that. Yeah. And especially when you feel so poorly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough to be brave. Yeah, I absolutely. And yeah. so, um, thank you very much. I think it, you make really valid points and uh, I hope that, that you're not too exhausted after. Um, no, no. It's great. <laughs> um, um, I wonder, um, I'm interested to get, to, to, we're at quarter past seven, so I need to keep an eye on the time. Um, but I think it was, was it Rosalind? Rosalind Singleton who put menopause, let me just leave that there. And Claudia and I in particular, Claudia's doing some work on this, um, are interested in um, a sort of fertility, the fertility arc, I don't know if that's a term. Um, but I'm, I am interested in, um, and actually thinking about what Lois said earlier on about the sort of uh, lack of testing for surgical devices in particular. Um, there are all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful um, treatments available, innovative you know, treatments for fertility um, to either extend your fertility, you know, you can delay menopause and you can freeze your eggs and things like that. I, I wonder if um, people have comments and remarks to make about that whole element of uh, female physiology um, and the types of treatments that are available, some of them privately, some of them on the NHS, um, that would seem to me a sort of commercialization of fertility in, in, in lots of ways for those people who can access those kinds of treatments. I wonder if people have experiences of or particular opinions of um, the way that some of that stuff is handled. There's been a quite a lot said more recently about menopause and Lois has written a lot about menopause too maybe Lois can weigh in on some of this stuff um I'm just interested to know this thing about the sort of particularly what is positioned as an innovative fertility treatment um and whether those things are are they are they safe do they work you know wh where are we at with the sort of um regulation of, of that space Lois it might be something that you could talk to hello um, yeah, so I've, I've done loads on this. In fact, yeah. I'm, I'm doing something about menopause at the moment. Um, uh, but it is really interesting this that, you, you know, I've been working in this area for so long and nothing really changes. I, I mean, I was amazed 20 years ago that um, infertility is, was considered a, a, a sort of female problem by the male dominated gynecology world and that and you talk to people now and these are women and they still uh, or men and they still say you know huge amounts of resources and money um, has been devoted to investigating the potential problems of the female half of the couple and yeah. they do minimal testing on men still in in 2020 and um menopause i've, I've just interviewed a whole load of women because there was some data that was going to be presented at the world menopause society i think it is or association um talking about the fact that this is a massive survey of 5,000 women and um uh, vast numbers of them had been referred for treatment for all sorts of other things that were nothing to do with menopause, prescribed um, antidepressants, which seems to be the sort of go-to catch-all cure by a lot of GPs, when actually they had uh, menopausal symptoms. And um, now we're all living to such absurd ages and in, in good health. Um, and we know that um, menopause isn't going to, uh, sorry, HRT isn't going to give you breast cancer. Um, you would have thought things would move on, but it's, it's just interminably slow. And I also think that there is a drive by the media, you know, that which applied to the sort of coverage of um, the contraceptive pill, you know, it must call, there must be a, um, a downside to women trying to control their 
fertility and control their hormones. So they, a huge amount of effort was devoted into trying to prove that the contraceptive pill must do something to you. A huge amount of effort devoted into trying to prove that HRT must be harmful. And at the time I thought, well, if you're a researcher and you've been given funds to prove that HRT is harmful, then you're incentivized to do that. Yeah. And um, e even now, um, there was a study produced in JAMA about a month ago saying HRT is is not going to do anything harmful to you but nevertheless the coverage in the mainstream media still alighted on the one glimmer of a suggestion that there might be a higher incidence of breast cancer not a higher death rate but a higher incidence of breast cancer among women given hrt uh, so they're still trying the, the media is still trying to promote the message that hrt is a nasty sinister dodgy treatment when all the evidence suggests it's yes, not. Otherwise. Thank you um, Lois. I'm going to go to Hattie Ruiz who has her hand up in the, my little list of... Hi Hattie. Hello, hello. Sorry, is, am, I, am, I, am I working? Am I unmuted now? Yes. No, I can hear you. I can see you. Okay, great. <laughs> great. great. <laughs> um, I'm actually interested in, in going back to fertility. From my personal experience, it's actually, it's very difficult to to kind of determine um someone well it's, it's difficult to be tested for your fertility um certainly from my experience so i um have had issues with not not having regular periods um and having pcos and various other things and so and having kind of issues with my hormones and being pre-diabetic and various other things um, and so I saw an endocrinologist and sort of said, you know, I'd like to test my fertility. And he said, well, um, we can't do that. You can't do that. Not unless you've been trying for a year to have a baby. And mm. I, I just sort of thought this is quite interesting because I feel as though, you know, for a lot of young people, not, not exclusively women, but presumably people would like to perhaps know before they start trying for a child or whatever. And it's just a the kind of fertility isn't really not really spoken about and again you know I think it's, it's a very important point that it often falls to the woman that sort of ex kind of the expectation of it is, is if there's something wrong it's to do with the woman but I was just quite shocked that I it, they sort of said oh well you know we can't we can't really do that we can't really check for that unless you've been trying for a year and I said well can I just lie and say I have I mean how does that you know how does that, that work you do, isn't it when if you're in a if you're in a relationship and you want to have a baby and maybe you're a bit older I think people do just lie and say we've been trying for a year can we get on the can we get on the list um and I think you're it's interesting and, and it's certainly certainly in relation to fertility but also in other things that I had some uh, a, a member was private messaging me actually funny enough in a thinking not about medical science at all actually um last week to say uh, that you know he had been deemed not mentally ill enough to receive treatment and to go away until he was much, much poorlier in order to be able to, and I think that does happen, you know, quite, quite a lot. And perhaps the fertility testing is part of the same principle that the NHS sort of has to, you know, limit its, its focus on the, what seemed to be the worst, the worst cases. Um, thanks very much, Hattie. Nice to see you. And thank you for your contribution. Um, it's 24 minutes past seven. And I do really want to have the opportunity to come back briefly to our three, um, uh, experts um, just for 30 seconds um, what the reason why we do thinkings at tortoise is partly because we want to hear the contributions of our members and for them to participate in the journalism and partly because honestly we're looking for stories um, as I say myself and Claudia have an interest in this area and have a few little irons in the fire in the sort of field of um, uh, of, of women's health but Perhaps we start with Sarah. Sarah, if you were us, what would be the story that you would send us after with our investigative team of journalists with their notebooks and their pens in their hands? I think I think the area that I'm really interested in, and obviously, you know, as we've talked about this evening, COVID presents lots of really interesting opportunities um, for looking at sex and gender differences. I think my um, concern is what happens to all the other 
particularly women's health issues in the yeah. meantime I think there's a real danger that that so many research and clinical resources are diverted to COVID that actually you know things like I mean I know um, the Eva Pill who are a gynecological cancer charity are really concerned about you know and not just the fact that that screening programs have been disrupted but actually about the fact that women feel like it's more difficult to access their GPs and so knowing the difficulties that women have anyway in being taken seriously getting a kind of timely diagnoses I think there's a real danger of um, you know people almost kind of going oh well I shouldn't bother the GP it's really difficult yeah. to get yeah. there's all this COVID stuff going on I'll just leave it um, and it, you know from a health perspective as well that um, that women's health issues that have been underfunded and under-researched already get kind of just pushed further to the bottom of the pile. Fascinating, thank you. It would certainly be interesting to know how the prioritisation decisions are being made as regards to when those regular services get mm -hmm. back on and how the backlogs are cleared would certainly be something that would be interesting to know. Um, Lois, what about you? If you were us, what would be the story that we should be going after in this, in this space? Um, what in terms of infertility treatment do you well, mean? In, in, in relation to um, whether it would be infertility or whether it would be, uh, you know, sex disaggregated barriers to what, what would be the thing, the sort of controversy that, that is most urgently requiring investigation? In I would to say the, um, the uh, gender imbalance in clinical trials. Right. Why? there are not why there are not um, equal numbers of women in um, in clinical trials i mean the same applies to um non-white people we know that they're yeah. majorly underrepresented but i would say why are why are women not equally represented across the board yeah fantastic thank you very much and lastly uh, dr ripple before i try and bring some threads together um what would be what would be the story that you would like for tortoise to lend its full investigative weight behind? So I'd agree with Sarah, except I would just kind of expand it actually, um, which is to say, because my background is in global health, um, I've been communicating with a lot of colleagues internationally and what is happening globally to women's health and women's health services when especially low and middle income countries are dealing with COVID with fewer resources than we have is astounding. Um, over 50% of services for women have been cut in the Philippines so that they can create spare capacity to deal with COVID. So yeah. it's the first area that gets cut. And I think, you know, I think it's really important to expand that view beyond the UK and to look at what, what how this is affecting women internationally. Brilliant. Um, that's fantastic and excellent that you can, I mean, not excellent, it's obviously horrendous, but it's brilliant that you can share with us with some degree of certainty that it is women's services that are the first to be cut in these lower middle income countries and that's that's a thread that we can really pull at and um, there's been a number of things that i'm really interested in to follow up on um the the as, as so often in the in the thinkings it's the small details of the things that i'm kind of thinking that's worth looking at which is this whole question about how uh, the, the glass ceiling i guess you would call it in in medicine and um the glass ceiling is perpetuated by small details of policy and the, the shared parental leave set up in the NHS is particularly interesting as a way to unlock that. Um, I'm completely astounded that um, surface anatomy isn't taught on women because the medical students you know, aren't asked to come in and wear a sports bra and draw on a woman's body. That's completely fascinating to me. Um, I'm interested that male rats are cheaper. I mean, I've never bought a rat. I've never investigated the price of one, but that to me is interesting too. Um, I, I will look into, um, for almost my own satisfaction, the day that the Cumberledge report was published and what was the lead headline story on that day, um, to Lois's point about the fact that it was kind of buried um, which is evident that this whole idea, um, sorry, less expensive, I mean less expensive, um, male rats are cheaper. Um, this whole idea that this is just sort of a bit of stuff and nonsense um, and the girls should just sit down and be quiet and we've got a pandemic going on, so hush, hush kind of thing. I will look for my own um, satisfaction to see what was the lead story on that day. 
and um, this worldwide problem on a lack of testing for surgical devices, which isn't unique to women, um, but obviously is something that just seems extraordinary to me. And surely somebody somewhere is, um, is looking at that. So there's a lot in there um, and it's 31 minutes past seven and I've, I've really, really enjoyed um, this evening's conversation. I want to say a big, big thank you to Lois for um, joining us at the last minute. She was absolutely brilliant. Um, and of course, to Sarah and to um, Dr. Ripple and um, Catherine, um, you've provi provided us with a load of food for thought. and I'm sure you're very, very busy. So thank you very much to you and to everybody who joined us. And we will continue to push against this um, slightly ajar door um, because Claudia and I have got the bit between our teeth now. So please hang in there and look out for more from us. Um, have a lovely rest of the evening and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs>